Welcome to Meat Bone Express, the filmmaking podcast. Today on the program, we will be speaking to Armand White, who is uh, often considered the most controversial uh, film critic in the world. I certainly find him the most inspiring. Armand, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for, for asking me and having me. Firstly, I would like to ask you about uh, working for both a gay publication and a conservative publication at the same time. Has that ever been complicated? No, not so far. Uh, so Not so far. In my career as a writer, I've always written for publications that were open to my voice, open to my point of view. And that's, that's all I ask. And uh, I'm fortunate to have two publications of, of the stature of National Review and Out Magazine. I'm, I'm happy to write for them and uh, glad to be at both places. Recently I, I read an article uh, that you preferred Paul W.S. Anderson uh, to Paul Thomas Anderson. Rather than talk about the article, um, th there was a great comment uh, uh, un under the article uh, and I, I just want to quickly quote it and it says, Armand White isn't unpredictable at all. He has certain principles with regards to cinema that by reading his reviews are easily understood. He hates nihilism and he loves humanism. Uh, do you think that's a fair comment? Sure. Yes, that's fair. And uh, to expand, I guess, on your first question, uh, one can say that uh, writing for National Review and Out, uh, two publications that might superficially seem to be opposed to each other, really just give me the opportunity to express my humanism uh, to two different audiences, perhaps, but also in two different ways. Uh, one way with National Review that might be a little be a little more political, and one with Out Magazine in a way that might be perhaps a little more culturally oriented. But in both, in both, in the cases of both publications, uh, I am able to to try to articulate my point of view towards towards the arts, towards film, towards culture, and a, it is a point of view that I that is in favor of humanism. Uh, that, that believes that life does have a meaning and, and that human beings uh, owe each other a certain amount of mutual respect and that this, should, this is what we should aim for as politicians, this is what we should aim for as, as sexual people as well, as social people too. And that's what I look for in movies, that's, what I, that's the way I try, to, I try to live my life as well. So how do you feel about uh, nihilism? And how do you feel about uh, nihilism in cinema? Well, you know, the funny thing about nihilism and also about the cynical view of life and art, it's the kind of thing that, uh, that appeals, it's kind of age-based. I think it appeals to young people, particularly teenagers, because it seems to be smart. Uh, it, it takes, a, it takes a, a, an awareness of the world and the way human beings mistreat each other, and it responds to it with a kind of self-protectiveness. And as a, as a teenager, as an adolescent, you think you've got it all figured out, and so cynicism is the way to be. Uh, negative points of view, or negative perspectives on life, on the world, uh, seem smart to you as a young person. As you get older, I think you, if you mature, <laughs> if you don't just get older in age, but if you mature emotionally, you start to understand that life is complicated and that the difficult things in life must be responded to with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a healthy, in a healthy way, in a way that will improve things, in a way that makes life bearable and possibly better. And in that sense, uh, nihilism loses its fascination. It loses the fascination that it might have for a teenager who, who thinks that a, a negative perspective a life is meaningless perspective, a, a, a perspective that uh, there is no worth or value or importance to life. That that loses that loses uh, it loses significance. It, it loses credibility. It loses useful usefulness as one gets older. I'd like to ask you about Pauline Kael and your, sure. your your relationship with with her and her, her writing, why isn't she talked about very often? 
uh, certainly in academic circles. Um, some people from uh, universities have said to me that she's not considered a serious writer in cinema studies. Uh, could you tell me about um, uh, how Pauline Kael has uh, influenced you, affected you, and your, um, your, your, your feelings about Pauline Kael? Pauline Kael was the first film critic I read who demonstrated that movies could be written, that movies and popular culture could be written about in a serious way. Uh, that movies could be written about as an art form as well as another form of popular culture. Uh, you could you could look at movies and talk about them, write about them, with both perspe perspectives. Uh, academics live in their own world. They you know they have they have their own bubble, and they only like their own kind. So Pauline Kael has never been accepted in academia. That's not new. What is new is that she's no longer respected in mainstream media. It was. It was, it was revealing and funny to me uh, about five or six years ago uh, when I was editor of a publication called City Arts. And at that time, uh, two books came out. One was a, a new collection of Kale's writing, that, and another was a biography of Kale. And with the publication of both those books, uh, there, were also, there was also an article printed in the New Yorker magazine, which is, which is the the publication where Pauline Kael wrote for so many years uh, that that blasted her, that ridiculed her. And despite the fact that there were two simultaneous books uh, dedicated to her work, all of a sudden it became apparent that in today's mainstream media uh, that she was no longer respected, that even the publication <laughs> that was her home no longer respected her. And I think uh, that that was surprising to me. I, I, I've, I've always known that she had no academic cachet, but that's, that's the fault of, of a uh, closed-minded academia. But I, didn't, I, al I had always suspected that in the world of popular culture, popular journalism, uh, mainstream media, that she was a name to reckon with, and having written for a publication like The New Yorker, that she would always be respected, but that respect is gone. And I think that's happened, that that having happened is a result of the change in popular culture where movies and popular culture are no longer criticized. Uh, criticism in a sense is <laughs> unpopular these days and Pauline Kael's current <laughs> ignominy or her, her current disfavor is another sign of that, that, that criticism is no longer popular and is very rarely practiced. And I find this confusing because um, uh, I, I think that's true, that, that criticism has uh, almost become a, a sort of microaggression. And, uh, you know, Pauline Kael, she, she, she could be very aggressive uh, with, with, her, with her criticism. But we sort of live in a, in a culture now where there's a lot of purging, where, you know, there's all kinds of, of sort of criticism. So it's, it's quite sort of confusing. Some things can be criticized, but uh, others certainly. can't. Certainly. Uh, but it's also interesting to simply to note the change. Uh, Pauline Kael, uh, like, like Andrew Sarris, who, who was another major influence on my thinking about film, uh, they, they both represented a, a great period in, in American li literature, shall we say. Uh, they both wrote, they both made their names primarily in the 1960s. This is also the era of what, what's known as new journalism, you know, the era of, of uh, Norman Mailer and Tom Wolfe, Esquire magazine. Uh, this is a period where a certain kind of writing ability and personal perspective on the world was expected and respected in journalism. And it was a, it was a, it was a period when film criticism became very popular. As a, as a journalistic practice. Uh, that's gone too. Even though <laughs> there are more people writing about movies than ever on, on, on the internet, uh, it's not criticism. It's, it's, it's not criticism, certainly not criticism as, as erudite people like Pauline Kael and Andrew Sarris and John Simon and several others represented it in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, that's, that's changed. And that, that also reflects a cultural change, and not for the better. 
but but it, it's important, I think, to understand what Pauline Kael, Andrew Saris, and John Simon represented. They represented a, a period of, of intellection, a period when popular culture was considered to be art and could be talked about in serious ways. Uh, that's gone too now. Now popular culture is just a pastime and it's a way not to, not for people to understand life better or understand cultural history better, but it's a way for people to, uh, to parade their attitudes. It's a way for people to to uh, certify that they belong to certain kind of hive minds, certain kinds of groups. Uh, there's less interest in art as art, and so there's less interest in criticism of art as, as, as part of the humanities. That's all gone now. Now, now there's just this uh, free-for-all of, of, of opinions rather than analysis, because criticism has to be analysis. That's what Saris and Kale both taught me. And now it's just opinion. And, and it has to be a, a, an opinion that, that people agree upon rather than an opinion that expresses one's personal point of view. I think uh, what your writing uh, shares with uh, Kale, it seems like a living thing. I, I suspect there's a real embrace of the subjective. If one of the reasons why Kale isn't accepted in the academic realm is that film studies has become sort of scientific and it's, it's uh, it talked about as if it were a measurable thing rather than poetry. And, and I just wondered if, uh, if, if Kale were um, to be sort of embracing uh, the, the poetic and the subjective side of cinema, whether that subverts uh, a university ideology where they have answers to things, very clear answers, measurable uh, uh, sort of answers to things. Um, and if someone like Kale comes along, if they find that threatening and the idea of that, that kind of thinking threatening, is, is Pauline Kale uh, in, in, and, and her, her, her way of writing and thinking uh, threatening? Well, okay, so you're talking about academia. And uh, because, because, okay, so let's talk about academia a little bit. You use the word scientific. Um, that's... <laughs> that's that's generous of you, uh, but I think what's, happen what ha what's happened in our universities around the world, especially in the, re in the West, is not that uh, university education has become more scientific or more technical, it's become politicized. And uh, what's the big difference in, in academic criticism and criticism from the great period of criticism, film criticism in the 1960s and 70s, is, is, is that in academia, film studies have become politicized based on structuralism and semiotics, which are a which are Marxist-based forms of analysis. It's become political in in film criticism and aesthetics have been politicized in universities, uh, and of course there there is that con there is that conformity in universities of people thinking alike. But what they think alike, it, it's, it's helpful to know exactly what how they all think alike, and how they all think alike is they they all think like Marxists, and that's the only thing they respect. They don't respect the individual analysis that that, that we learn from the history of criticism. If you go back to John Ruskin or Northrop Fry, uh, that's not the criticism that academics respect anymore. If, if you go back to Nabokov or, or you go back to, to uh, Alfred Kazan or Kazan or, or, or Irving Howe uh, or, or Malcolm Cowley, uh, that old-fashioned kind of academic criticism is gone now. Now only Marxist criticism prevails in the academies. And Pauline Keller and Andrew Saris and John Simon and James Agee, these were not, these were not uh, Marxist critics. Uh, they, they were humanist critics. I sometimes even wonder, because uh, you know, I, I teach now and then at, at colleges, but I'm not really all that much into the, into the college scene. I, I still wonder if, if, if the humanities are taught anymore, uh, if, if, if universities still teach students how to appreciate art as a form of human expression that records human experience? Uh, or do they just teach art as a way of, of 
of uh, certifying that Marxist principles are foremost in students' brains. Uh, that's an important difference. Uh, in academia, it's not scientific. Aesthetics are not scientific. Aesthetics are politics now. And as I think everybody is aware, in, in 2017, 2018, uh, you got to have a particular political point of view in order to be accepted in the mainstream. So it's complicated now because you, 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 you not only must have a particular opinion about film in order to be accepted by the mainstream, but you also have to have a particular political opinion in order to be accepted in, in the mainstream. Do, do you think you have to have a, a particular uh, political opinion uh, to be a filmmaker now? Well, to be accepted in the mainstream is what you have to have. <laughs> if you don't care about being accepted in the mainstream, if you want to challenge the mainstream, you have any opinion you want, you have any perspective you want. Uh, you can be an individual if you want, but you risk not being accepted in the mainstream. That's the difference. You know, if you if you make movies like Judd, if you make movies like Judd Apatow, uh, you'll be you'll be accepted in the mainstream. If you don't, you won't be. If you make movies like Terrence Davies, you won't be accepted in the mainstream. Let, let's say if you look at the sort of generic Sundance film, uh, do you think that that's uh, sort of akin to um, Soviet realism, in that there's a certain mode? Uh, or a certain kind of um, worldview that must be expressed, um, you know, for a film to be sort of accepted. Is is, is yeah. that is there a sort of parallel there? Yes, that's funny, Mike. It's, yes, it's exactly like Soviet realism without the art. <laughs> you know, Sun, Sundance Sundance is all politics. You know, no aesthetics, or rather, rather paltry aesthetics. Uh, Yes, yes. I mean, you you draw a beat on it. Yes, Sundance, Sundance is is one of the generators of of politically correct filmmaking, and there is a Sundance type of movie. Uh, there are Sundance politics. All all the all the movies that come out of Sundance that that the media praises out of Sundance all share the same political perspective. Uh, there, there is no, di there is no diversity at Sundance. There's no political diversity. There is no aesthetic diversity at Sundance. It's all the same garbage. I just wanted to, you know, talk about the filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky, who was making Christian films in, in a Soviet, uh, officially uh, atheist regime, uh, and and he is then exiled uh, for the rest of his life. Is that one of the reasons why we we don't get a lot of religious cinema from America, d despite a very large percentage of the population uh, identifying as uh, religious uh, and and Christian? That that's as that's as good an explanation as as any. Um, Hollywood tends to be Hollywood being the I guess the uh, uh, the center of film production in, in the West. Uh, Hollywood tends not to be religious. Uh, it's it's it is in fact hostile to religion. It tends to be irreligious, sacrilegious, atheistic. In fact, and so. Uh, People who are religious don't gravitate there. Religious filmmakers, spiritual filmmakers, don't gravitate towards Hollywood. Uh, and the ones that do, and the ones who make it through through the maze of corruption, are are rare and few. Like uh, like Terrence Malick, for instance, uh, doesn't happen often. But you do have a lot of atheistic, uh, cynical, nihilistic filmmakers in Hollywood because that's what Hollywood. <laughs> respects. So what happens uh, to you as a critic uh, when you don't agree uh, with the consensus a lot of the time? Uh, what kind of uh, repercussions are there and, and how are you treated? There's always pushback. Uh, there's always pushback. And I, I guess as a, as a black American I was raised to expect it. And uh, and to not let it stop me. So there's always pushback. It's pushback on, on on every level and in every way. Uh, what's what's probably.
best to talk about uh, without without seeming uh, self-pitying is to talk about the kinds of professional pushback one receives. And this is primarily the the obstruction one one experiences when one does not write for a mainstream publication. National Review and Out Magazine are well-known publications. I don't think of them as mainstream publications. <laughs> and when you don't write for a mainstream publication, you you cease to be important or you have less importance to publicists and to people who run film institutions. They don't really they only care about the mainstream publication, about mainstream media. Uh, they give preference to mainstream media. If you don't write for mainstream media, uh, you, it's a little tougher to practice your craft, to practice your profession. Uh, that's, that's the kind of obstruction or, or pushback that I regularly receive. Although, although certainly, you know, there are, there are publicists who, who are really good at their jobs and they, and they understand that there are all kinds of publications who can help them get the word out about their product. There are those, but there are also the, the, the opposite kind. And then and then then there's there's the you know there's the there's the the difficulty, the obstruction, the pushback that one receives. It's that's based on based on race. That that's all that's that's always a fact. And it's never gone away. Um, so, you know, as a black American, I was raised to expect it. Uh, I don't like it, and I oppose it the best I can. But I, I but I've also, you know, I've, I've also been fortunate. I, I, I write for National Review and Out Magazine. I'm, I'm, I'm able to get my opinion out there, to get my perspective out there. I'm, that's, that's a blessing. And, and that, and that's, the, and that's the way I push back against the pushback. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Some of your uh, writing for the National Review has been very insightful uh, in regards to, to race, particularly because of, of the films you are actually critical of, which are sort of universally thought of as progressive for African Americans, uh, but you uh, see them sometimes as dangerous, and I believe you've used the word uh, race hustler. Um, could, could you tell me what a, a race hustler is uh, and, and some of the films uh, that you see as uh, dangerous or condescending, and and why they are dangerous and, and condescending um, for African Americans. You know what a race hustler is. <laughs> it's someone who sells race to get ahead. <laughs> That's what it is. You know, I, you know that. Everybody knows that, but not everybody wants to admit it. So, I have to refer to my my background again. So, uh, I started out as a journalism student. I also got my master's degree at Columbia University in film history theory and criticism. Uh, the first journalism job that I got was writing for a newspaper here in New York City called the City Sun. The City Sun was a black owned newspaper and the City Sun had a motto uh, and that motto has is, is, is been abused recently but at the time and I, st I started writing for the City Sun in 1984 in 1984, the City Sun's motto was, was marvelous to me and, and, and rather fresh. That motto was speaking truth to power. And the City Sun was, was a wonderful paper to write for because it was, it was published and edited by two people, Andrew Cooper and Eutrice Lead, who were intelligent and courageous black folk and, and experienced journalists. And they wanted to produce a newspaper that was oriented towards the black community, towards black people, but a, a newspaper that could be taken seriously, a newspaper that, that operated with high standards and always, always had, had the best, had black, pe had black people's best in mind and best at heart. And the City Sun, when it was publishing, which was published between 1984 and 1996, it became a force in New York City. It became a force primarily because it was a, it could be taken seriously and it was produced by, by intelligent and principled people. And I'm not just talking about me. <laughs> and, and it was at the City Sun that 
that I learned uh, how important it was to have it, have a, a principled point of view and how important it was to even be able to criticize black people, black politicians, and black artists because, because it's important to do so. It's important to not just accept someone's work be simply because of their race or because of their gender, but to hold their work to a, to a high standard. I learned to do that at, at the City Sun. I also learned at the City Sun that there was an audience for it, that, that thinking black people appreciated it. And so using, <laughs> using the term race hustler for, for black filmmakers who don't have high standards is not new for me and it's not new to any black person or any white person who cares about art, who cares about standards, who cares about life, politics, who cares about race, gender, or whatever. That's not news. It's just uncommon these days. But I learned, I learned the value of having high standards and applying high standards to black artists. I learned that at the black-owned newspaper called The City Sun. And so I've tried my best to continue that practice in my own writing. And so uh, it's, it's what I do. And it's, it's what I think should be expected of, of anyone who's writing about the arts. Uh, write about it honestly. Don't simply write, about, write favorably about movies because they're made by a, a person of a particular race or gender, gender identity. Write about them and, and challenge them to, to be good. Challenge them to be better than, than what's come before. And that's not happening today. Today we're it's an entirely different era and uh, and so now we have race hustlers who can sell race and and the mainstream media, which does not tend to have the best of have black people's best interests at heart, uh, will sell any crap that a particular kind of black person has made. Uh, that goes for movies like Twelve Years a Slave. It goes for movies like like Get Out. And and if you if you looked at the if you've seen the cover of the new issue of Time magazine, uh, which puts this film called A Wrinkle in Time by Ava DuVernay on the cover, uh, you got you have to be concerned. I haven't seen it, so I can't venture an opinion on. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't venture an opinion on A Wrinkle in Time, but. Ava DuVernay's past record as a filmmaker is not a good one. However, she has made films that the mainstream media, which doesn't care about black people, to, to use a Kanye West phrase, uh, the mainstream media loves Ava DuVernay because she says the things that mainstream media likes to hear in their own politics, the things that they believe politically. And so they have promoted her even though she is a race hustler. And race hustler is not a new term. Ava du not, DuVernay did not invent the concept of race hustler, but she's doing her best to promote it. So you're saying uh, that a lack of rigor and, and criticism on on, uh, on 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 black work is is uh, in, in fact dangerous uh, to African American culture uh, because it it, it 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 keeps it down because it doesn't have. Um, uh, the, 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 the same rigor? Is that what you're sort of saying? Doesn't have the same rigor, doesn't have the same rigor, doesn't have the same values in our politically correct era that we're living in now. I guess the simplest way to put it is that uh, mainstream media and mainstream politicians like to look at, and liberal politicians, might as well be plain about it and honest about it, liberal politicians and liberal media likes to look at black people and gay people as victims. And it wants to hold them and keep them down in a, in a victim position, which I guess is also a position of, of <laughs> obsequious gratitude. And that's the position of black people that the mainstream media promotes. And I won't have it. <laughs> I, won't be, I won't be a party to it. And then, and then you know, then, then it comes down simply to the fact that most of these movies are are not good movies. Uh, you look at something like you look at something like Selma, and it's it's pitifully poor filmmaking, um, despite its subject. It doesn't do its subject justice, which is the, the an account of the civil rights era, the civil rights movement in the United States during the 1960s. It doesn't do that subject justice 
but simply as, sto as visual storytelling, it's quite poor and it's quite inadequate. Uh, is uh, a sort of a, a political correct correctness uh, and identity uh, politics taken over to such a degree uh, that we will like something uh, because of its politics before we even see it? Yes, that's exactly true. <laughs> yes, yes, it's true. Uh, but when 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 that happens, I, I guess you could say that that's just being human. But when that happens, it's it's kind of lazy. You know, you're not we're not challenging ourselves when we when we like a movie simply because it says the things we want to hear. Uh, the best art is the art that challenges you. Uh, one one of the, one of the thrills of, of watching Jean Luc Godard movies is that you at some point in you, you, you realize, I never thought of it that way before. Uh, and as you watch a, a Godard film, you start saying that to yourself many, many times because he, his films make you think. And people are not accustomed to that in most movies. Most movies simply, uh, most movies, most Hollywood movies being, main, being mainstream commercial product, simply want to offer a salve to you. And, and satisfy you and, and make you not think just make you comfortable and satisfied and happy without thinking and and unfortunately that's the way most people look at most movies they're not accustomed to being challenged at the movies but this can become dangerous when especially in this politically correct era when the movies become more and more explicitly politicized and try to force people to all think alike and not just think alike, but think the same thing. Uh, think that black victimization is 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 fun, and is okay, and and puts one in a position that one should be satisfied in. That's dangerous. Um, and the same thing. The same thing. Same thing goes on in in movies in what you could, what we would call gay movies too. Gay movies are also also encourage the victim mentality. And that's just not helpful to anyone. Things, rather than simply identify themselves as a humane position. Uh, one of the things I, I try to write about often in, in Out Magazine is that uh, the best movies about gay experience are the, are the ones that show characters trying to understand themselves and realize who they are as human beings rather than simply identify themselves as social victims. I just want to uh, bring you back to, to Goddard for a, for a minute um, because uh, w one thing uh, that, that your writing uh, shares with um, uh, that French New Wave period of critics is uh, you, an embrace of uh, the B-movie, uh, the genre film uh, and, and what is supposed to be uh, low art, pure joys of, of um, uh, a, a genre. Uh, this is something that you're uh, often criticized for. Could you explain some of your embrace for uh, B cinema uh, directors like uh, Paul W. S. Anderson uh, and, and, and why you love these films? Well, I think it's, I think it's basic to one's appreciation of cinema. You know, uh, yes, yes, isn't it, isn't it interesting that the French New Wave, uh, that they adored American commercial movies, genre films, but <laughs> 
in the way they expressed that love, uh, they were <laughs> they were a highbrow artist. Uh, it, it, it might seem a kind of paradox, but that that's a, a fact about about the French New Wave critics and filmmakers. Yes, they did they did love American genre films, but most importantly about the French New Wave, you have to recall uh, that the French New Wave primarily loved silent movies, meaning they loved the essence of cinema. They understood that cinema is a kinetic art form, and, and their, their aesthetics all go back to an appreciation of silent movie aesthetics, frankly. Uh, you know, it's, it, yes, yes, they liked Hitchcock and Hawks, and, and particularly their silent, I'm sorry, their sound films in particular, but really, the French New Wave understood what was essential and vital about cinema, which is kinetics, which is, which is the aesthetics of the silent era. And if you understand that cinema is kinetics, you're more than likely going to drift towards action films and films that, that show an, 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 a, a kinetic a kinetic. Uh, beauty, brilliance, and ingenuity. And those tend to be genre films for the most part. And so I, I, that's, that's what I'm looking for too. As a, as a film student, I, I was always fascinated by silent movies. Uh, at, at, in grad school at Columbia, uh, I, I was one of the students who petitioned that there be a course in silent movies because, in silent cinema, because there was none. Uh, there, there were some silent films as part of the uh, as part of the curriculum, but there was not a course devoted to silent movies. And and classmates and I petitioned for a course on D. W. Griffith. We petitioned for it, which is to say, we demanded it, and we got it, because that's that's where the essence of cinema is. <laughs> you got to go back to Griffith, and and the French New Wave appreciated Griffith and Griffith's uh, contemporaries and the people he inspired, including the great artistic Soviet filmmakers of the, 19, of the 1920s. So uh, having an appreciation for genre movies is, is part of what every, every film critic and every film lover should have. Uh, appreciating those, the essence of cinema, which goes back to, to sustaining continuity with film history and not simply falling for celebrating what's, what's new, especially when what's new is not cinematic is not kinetic, is not, is not visual. And, and, that's, and that's, a problem, that's a problem that we have with, with that's a, a problem of contemporary movies for the most part. They are not visually interesting. Even the ones that are CGI based, uh, they, they, they tend to all look alike and it's become uninteresting. You, you've certainly uh, been a great uh, supporter of the work of Brian De Palma, who has uh, influences on his sleeves uh, it isn't a shame to uh, recreate uh, sequences from from Hitchcock. I just uh, would would like to ask, uh, uh, why do you like Brian De Palma, um, but you you don't like uh, Quentin Tarantino? And Tarantino cites uh, De Palma as a great influence on him. Uh, could, could you could you explain uh, uh, you, your different feelings about the two directors? I have no doubt that Tarantino cites a lot of filmmakers as influences, and they may well be but he doesn't do them any honor. Uh, just to quote them and to refer to them isn't, isn't good enough. Uh, th there's, a, there's a basic difference. I remember when, when Tarantino's Pulp Fiction came out, uh, there was a critic for a, a New York publication who praised him and said that Tarantino understands French New Wave conventions. And I thought, that's not true and, and it's unhelpful because you can look at Tarantino's films and see quite clearly that he does not understand French New Wave convictions. And French New Wave filmmakers believed in kineticism. They also believed in humanism. They made, they made movies about the human experience and about human feeling. Their movies of the French New Wave or the Nouvelle Vague gave, gave meaning and feeling to life and, and to cruelty and death. And Tarantino does not do that. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand what the French New Wave was doing 
when it referred to the to the history of Hollywood genre filmmaking. Uh, Quentin Tarantino is quite a different animal. He's, he's a comic sadist. He's not a humanist as the French New Wave were. Brian, and and as as the American filmmakers who were directly influenced by the French film French New Wave also were. That being filmmakers like Brian De Palma and Coppola and Scorsese and Spielberg and Walter Hill. Uh, these are humanist filmmakers. Tarantino's not a humanist filmmaker. Uh, and that, that's the basic difference. Also, Brian De Palma is, is extremely, supremely kinetic and visually oriented. Tarantino is not. Tarantino writes screenplays and then films the dialogue. He's, he's, not, he's not, to put it simply, he's not a visual filmmaker. Do, do you think that's why he's so popular? Because the the, the sort of rise of television, uh, you know, I, I would struggle to tell you one director that works in television, uh, but I could tell you the writers. So it's a sort of writer's medium. Uh, do, do you think that um, that there's a connection there? Oh, oh, of course, of course there is. Uh, you know, a, a Tarantino movie is all about the dialogue. It's not about the images, ever. What do you think of uh, uh, David Cronenberg's Crash? Well, that's an interesting film, and, and it, it has what I remember from Crash is is that it has it has very admirable rhythm and visual texture. I also remember uh, there's a quote from uh, Bernardo Bertolucci when Crash played at the Cannes film, Cannes film Festival, and Bertolucci said that it was a it was a religious film. And, and that's an interesting perspective. I, I, th I think I know what Bertolucci meant by that because it's, it's about people who are devoted, about devotees who are searching for some kind of meaning. And, and I guess there can, you can see that as a, as a kind of religious parable. And it's, it's an interesting film. I, it's not a film that I, I love, but I respect it. So what is your uh, mission as a critic now uh, as opposed to w when you first started, oh, I think it's the same. Uh, I think one thing I didn't, one thing I didn't mention to you, is that uh, Black American, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, also known as Motown, and and fortunately raised in Motown during the period of Motown's greatness, and so I, a large part of, of what I am interested in is is in popular culture, that is as exciting as exciting and as moving as as Motown records as Motown music I like popular culture I, I'm excited by it I, I'm not just entertained not just entertained by it but I am I am I learn from it and and that's and those are qualities that I also seek seek in art in all in different forms of art that's what I'm always after and and as a critic it's always a process, as I, as I just said, it's a learning process too. And, and I'm always interested to, to see a film or hear a new piece of music and try to learn from it, but primarily try to understand what it is I'm looking at, what it is I'm listening to, and try to figure out, figure that out, try to figure that out as, as well as try to grasp its meaning. And to me, that's, that's the excitement of, of being a film critic. Uh, that's the excitement of, of being a person who who enjoys popular culture. Uh, trying to trying to understand a, a movie like like Terrence Davies' um, A Quiet Passion, trying to understand a, a piece of music like Morrissey's Low in High School. Uh, it's exciting to try to figure it out. It's, it's not that you hear this music or see this movie, and and you just get it. Uh, the process of watching and listening involves an effort towards understanding it and grasping it um, and, and any work of art that's grasped too easily probably is not very good and certainly is not going to uh, sustain you as a person it's not you know movies and music that you that you like too immediately tends not to be the music or movies that you will go back to it's it's the 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 film and the music that challenges you, that makes you think, <laughs> that makes you examine your own your own predispositions. Uh, that's the stuff that that holds on, that you hold on to. Have you ever been so challenged by a, a, a piece of work, uh, a, a film, uh, that you actually disliked it strongly, 
uh, but then came around to actually loving it. Uh, well, the, well, the example that I've, 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 I've often tell people, because it's the one that, <laughs> that immediately comes to mind, is Robert Altman's Shortcuts. And though, though Altman's films are, are important to me, and, and I've always loved them uh, from, from the moment I saw MASH, uh, when I saw Shortcuts, it, it, was an odd, it was an odd experience. I saw Shortcuts and I thought, something's wrong here. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what happened to him, meaning Altman, but this one isn't working. This one is, this one is upsetting and it's, 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 not, it's not doing what his previous great films had done. And, and I, I, I thought, I remember leaving the screening thinking, boy, he, 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 he screwed up this time. And then, then the next day I woke up and it was all I could think about. I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I, I went to see it again as soon as possible. And, and the second viewing of Shortcuts, throughout, throughout the second viewing, I kept like slapping myself in the head thinking, wow, wow, I, 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 just, I just missed it. It, 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 it struck me as, 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 as a stunning achievement. And, I, and I, remember, I remember meeting, talking to someone about it later, and talking to a woman about it, and she said, oh, Shortcuts was terrifying. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's it. That, that's, what I, that's what I couldn't accept the first time I saw it. It's a terrifying movie. But I also think now that it is one of Altman's greatest films. But the first viewing, I wasn't able to wasn't able to have that opinion that, that that response the first time I saw it. I'm only human. When uh, a young uh, aspiring critics uh, sort of uh, reach out to you uh, and ask for for advice, what what is the the, the simplest and best piece of advice uh, that you can give them? Uh, today I'm going to say, uh, know thyself. <laughs> That's the best advice. Uh, Figure out who you are before you presume to tell other people anything. Figure out who you are. But that, that's, that's, that's big <laughs> and, and, that, and that's difficult. Uh, the, the thing I, I would most likely want to impress on any young person is uh, know what you're talking about and, and study film history. If you don't know film history, just don't bother us. Don't bother us with opinion or anything. Study film history. You know, look, go back to old movies and know know the art form. Know the art form before you write about it. Uh, study it before you write about it. And and really study it. Don't just concentrate on one genre, but go back and and read and watch the history of film. Or whatever art form you want to be, you want to eat, practice. You want to you want to observe in your criticism. Study that art form. One, one, of the, one of the most upsetting things about mainstream media and the reviewers who get hired is that it, it's, as if, it's, it's as if knowledge of the art form is never required of film reviewers. And this is something that, that publications would not ever dare uh, for an architecture critic or a music critic or even a book critic. But when it comes to movies, uh, too many editors and publishers think anybody can do it, and that nobody must know, no one must know anything besides the latest stuff. Now you got to know the history of film, in, in in order to do a good job as a critic. In order to be in order to be an informed and intelligent viewer, you you need to know the history. It's it's important to know the history of of an art form. It's part of the humanities. When I said before that I wasn't sure whether or not universities taught humanities as a course anymore, and I don't know that they do, uh, it's important to know the history of the humanities, of, of, the, of the art forms, of the cultural forms that help human beings sustain themselves. We all, we all need to know that. I wouldn't presume to tell a filmmaker how to do anything, because, because some filmmakers uh, break the rules and, and recreate the art form. And people have to be free. Artists have to be free to do that. Critics are a different matter, <laughs> but artists have to be free to break the rules, um, and because that's how the art form grows. 
that's how any art form grows. Uh, you know, artists artists don't necessarily have to know the history. They have they just have to be able to accomplish what they're doing and express themselves in interesting ways. Uh, when I when I see a, a new film, when I see a film by a, a a young filmmaker that is just ineptly made, well then then they they get the you know they they must face the wrath of measurement by the great work of the past. But if you have a filmmaker who who can be in, truly innovative, well that's that's something to protect, but it's also something to marvel at, and it doesn't happen often, by the way. The rise of the of the comic book film and its sort of uh, domination is, is that partly because uh, people can't find uh, the, the same myths and archetypes uh, in in other mainstream cinema that it's kind of been everything else has been subverted, everything else has been sort of turned upside down, um, and and the, the only place to go to find um, you know. Uh, you know, myths, archetypes, and, and even religious ideas are actually in the superhero films. Well, that, that's that's a good notion, Mike, and I I agree. Ex with 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 only this exception, that you can only you know, you know what what people are searching for uh, cannot be found in the Marvel films, and people who think so are mistaken. But what they're searching for can be found in the Zack Snyder DC films, because that's what Zack Snyder is all about. Uh, going back to to his Dawn of the Dead movie, going back to 300, uh, the man the man is concerned with mythology, and and he he's a contemporary artist, and he's and he is expressing the modern need for myths, and also to understand myths. You know, in, in in human terms, in modern human terms, and that's what's that's the beauty to me. That's that's the depth of films like Batman vs Superman and Man of Steel, and and that and that's what's so fascinating about about his visual gifts. Uh, he he doesn't make comic book imagery that's simply based on on feats of daring do. He's always interested in in visualizing uh, the, the strain of human, the strain of human struggle, if I can put it that way. Um, and in that sense, he, he want, he's, his interest in myth also connects to the, to the effort of, of, of human living. And you don't get that from the Marvel movies, but it's, it's all in Zack Snyder's films. His, his films are extraordinary for that reason. And, and you think there's a, an innate need in, in, in people um, for those things? Sure, sure, and the need is older than you and I. <laughs> yes, uh, mankind has always needed that. And uh, unfortunately, filmmakers like Tarantino don't understand it, and most contemporary filmmakers don't understand that. They, they, they've taken that humane essence out of cinema. But, but the best movies are the ones that remind us that, that we are human and, and of, of the struggle of, of humanity. That's, those, those are the best movies. <laughs> those, are the ones, those are the ones that truly move us. And the, and the, mar and the marvel of being human and the marvel of, under of understanding that, that we are perhaps part of something bigger than we currently know. Thank you so much, Armin, for, for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. Um, it. It's been great talking to you. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure as well.